So let's look at what decision boundary we get from logistic regression, the same way we did for the Gaussian discriminant analysis case. So let's define this function f as if the probability that y is 1 is greater than the probability y is 0. So that's essentially the decision we're trying to make. Which of the two classes is more likely? Uh, well, it's pretty easy to see that, that uh, whether class 1 is greater is just whether a, for our particular example here, is greater than 0. So another way of saying that is, is this value, w, trans, uh, w transpose x plus b, is this value greater than 0? So this is a linear function. So it will, uh, where 0 is going to be, or where it's greater than 0 versus less than 0, is going to be a linear boundary, again, in this hyperplane of our different variables. So here we're using a uh, specific example rather than just sort of abstract variables x1 and x2. This is for the iris prediction data set. Here we've actually trained it on these two uh, types of irises, actually the uh, Virginica iris versus everything else. And here's the decision boundary chosen by the logistic regression model. Um, so this is why we call logistic regression a linear classification method because it's going to give us a decision boundary, a linear decision boundary in our feature space. By the way, if our training examples are linearly separable, that is, if there exists some hyperplane that perfectly separates our positive from negative examples in our training data, then logistic regression will find such a hyperplane. Um, again, because logistic regression gives you the global optimum, and if we say they're linearly separable, then that is to say that, there, that that hyperplane exists, that gives you perfect accuracy, and so uh, logistic regression will find that. So it's worth asking, our Gaussian discriminant analysis, when we use the tied covariance matrix, that gave us linear decision boundaries. And logistic regression is also giving us linear decision boundaries. So what's the difference between them? So let's go back and look at our, uh, our analysis of those decision boundaries. So here I'm writing the those expressions from quite a few slides ago on Gaussian discriminant analysis, where we found that the probability that y equals c is this linear function, uh, where some, there's something that de depends just on the example, some, something that depends just on the class, and then this uh, linear function x times beta c that depends on multiplying our feature vector times uh, some vector beta. And then down here I've written just our normal logistic regression uh, expression so we can compare. So this is the log of that probability. Well, so if I want the full prob posterior probability, to get that I just need to take this thing, take the exp of it, and uh, to put that in the numerator and uh, put them all in the de denominator and sum them up. This is just our normal Bayes rule that I've written here. So it's not too hard to see that this thing is in the two uh, in the two class case is just the logistic function of a particular thing, and in fact, this is going to be some linear function of our features. Uh, so in fact, the, the form we get 
uh, from our, our Gaussian discriminant analysis, and by the way, specifically in the linear case, the linear discriminant analysis case, that is the case where we have tied covariance matrix, is exactly the same as our logistic regression. So if we're getting a model that has exactly the same form between these two methods, uh, is there any difference between them? Are they identical? And they are very similar. The only difference between them is that in the Gaussian discriminant analysis case, we're maximizing the joint probability, probability of x comma y. And in the logistic regression case, we're maximizing the conditional probability, probability of y given x. It turns out that doing this has pretty similar results, but not exactly the same results. So we're in the uh, in the assignment, we're going to ask you to think a little bit about uh, what the difference is there. More generally, we can divide uh, classification algorithms in general into two categories. Generative algorithms, where we're modeling or we're optimizing probability of x comma y, and discriminative classifiers, where we're optimizing probability of y given x. Um, so we saw two examples of, or one example of each of these types of classifier. There's, in the generative case, there's uh, naive Bayes and uh, Gaussian discriminant analysis. In the discriminative case, we have logistic regression. Uh, and a lot of the other classifiers that we might be familiar with, things like uh, uh, most discriminative uh, classification neural networks or sport vector machines, uh, if they if they if they're uh, coming at it from a probabilistic uh, perspective, sometimes. Some uh, some classifiers we might might be purely algorithmic. Uh, that is, we're not even attempting to to produce a posterior distribution. But most classifiers uh, can be thought of as producing a posterior distribution, and uh, many of those are discriminative classifiers uh, rather than generative. Uh, those things like neural networks and support vector machines. So let's let's think about um, the advantages and disadvantages of this two of these two types of classifiers. I should say uh, one other example of a generative classifier. Uh, a one popular method for image classification is using a uh, icing model on the pixels. This is some model that. Uh, that makes a that specifies a generative distribution over the pixels and uh, defines some pairwise probability among them. Uh, that gives you a, a generative model of the pixels and of the uh, pixels given the class. So that would be an example of a, a sort of more complicated generative classifier. We're going to get to those when we uh, towards the end of the course when we talk about probabilistic models. Okay, but let's look at the the uh, advantages of these two types of models. So uh, generative models, uh, first thing, they're easy to fit. We saw in the case of naive Bayes, uh, fitting the, the model was almost trivial. trivial. We just uh, took the data for a particular class and applied our standard uh, uh, MLE closed form analytics, analytical, analytical solution. Uh, and in fact, um, when uh, uh, I would say they're also easy to specify because uh, often if we can come up with some kind of generative story about how our features are produced, which we know if we understand our features a little bit and kind of where our data is coming from, often that's, that's uh, easy to come up with, then often it's easy to come up with that 
that generative distribution. Uh, another advantage is that if some features are missing, we can easily handle that using a generative model. Let's say we have a generative model and we want the uh, probability of our class, but for some reason we're missing some of our data. That is, we have x2 to d, but not x1. Uh, and what we have is a probability distribution over, uh, over all of our x's given y. Well, it's easy to figure out this probability that's proportional to probability of y the prior times we just have to marginalize out x1, which is to say that we uh, sum over all the possible values of x1 and put here probability of x1 to d, that is using the value of x1 and adding that to the rest of our values here uh, given y. That's just using our normal uh, uh, distribution. And in fact, it's even easier for naive Bayes. Uh, it's easy to show that, uh, we're not gonna do this here, but it's easy to show for naive Bayes, we have a big product of factors, one for each of our features. It's easy to show that if you have one feature that's missing, you can just drop that from the product. And in fact, that's exactly equivalent to doing this marginalization uh, that I did here. Okay, so that is when we have this generative model, we have a very principled way of handling missing features. We can just marginalize them out. Uh, a third advantage is that we can leverage unlabeled data. So that is, if we're in a semi-supervised case, that is, we have a uh, a bunch of y x pairs, and we also have a bunch of uh, of x's just all by themselves, where we don't have known labels. Uh, we're not going to talk too much about semi supervised learning in this course, but uh, it's not too hard to see that you can use those unlabeled x's to help us learn the parameters of our generative distribution. Uh, we just have to uh, basically impute the y's uh, and then uh, use the observed x's to, uh, to learn those uh, distributions. Uh, so uh, in kind of semi-supervised cases, uh, often in the real world, we have just a couple of labeled examples and a ton of unlabeled data. It's really easy to use that unlabeled data to get a really rich generative dis distribution for our x's uh, and then uh, we can augment our uh, labeled data with that improved training of that from that unlabeled data. Okay, now what about the advantages of discriminative models? Well, it turns out that discriminative models usually end up having better accuracy. That is because we're optimizing the probability of y given x, our posterior probability, well, if what we want is accuracy, that's directly what our model is optimizing. So in the logistic regression case, we're getting the global optimum of our objective, which is to say we're getting the uh, linear boundary that gives us the best accuracy, the best possible accuracy on our training set. Um, so because the generative model is uh, optimizing something that's a bit different than that, it often will give us a bit worse accuracy. One way to see that is like this. So here we have two different models. Here's the generative one and here's the discriminative one. The generative model, as part of its training, I should say that what we're learning here, here we have a univariate x, just a single observation, and we're trying to define the class from that. So here we've learned, our generative model has learned a probability of x for each of the two classes, and it might have some complicated uh, distribution. Here you can see it's like multimodal perhaps is this distribution of x given y. 
Uh, now notice that what the generative model has to learn is this kind of complicated thing, the distributions for both x and y, or uh, for, for x for both y equals one and y equals two, whereas the discriminative model is just trying to learn this curve here, that is the probability of y given various values of x. Um, so for that reason, because the generative training is in some sense wasting some of its time and, uh, and uh, data power on learning the actual shape of the different distributions, uh, sometimes we'll, the generative model will end up with worse performance. Um, and uh, and just, just a worth saying again that because the discriminative model, at least in the logistic regression case, is finding the global optimum of its objective, same with the generative one, um, the generative one is finding, in fact, the best joint probability x comma y. Uh, and so if, if that's the thing we're using to uh, as our evaluation, then we would want to go with the generative model every time. Um, uh, but the discriminative model, it's optimizing probability of y given x. So if what we are after is accuracy, then we're going to end up with better accuracy from the discriminative model. Uh, the last difference is that the two types of models require different assumptions. Uh, it's hard to tell which is better. So the generative model, uh, often if you have a reasonably large and complex set of features, you, let's say in a reasonable machine learning case, you might have hundreds or thousands of features, and often they're relatively complex. They have some complex relationship with one another. Uh, often you'll be forced to make uh, relatively strong assumptions about uh, the generative model of the features. A clear example of that is the naive Bayes model, where we made this assumption that they are independent given the class. Uh, so often the assumptions you have to make in a generative model are not so realistic. Uh, and that sometimes leads to poorly calibrated probability estimates. Uh, vice versa, discriminative classifiers, they're, the only thing they have to model is the posterior probability. So you'll often end up with a discriminative classifier with a better calibrated probability. Um, on the other hand, with the discriminative classifier, you're forced to make an assumption about what is the function that gets you from the labels to the class. In, uh, in the logistic regression case, we used a, uh, a linear function put through a sigmoid, uh, a sigmoid, uh, a function to get our probability. Uh, so in cases where we have good intuition about the generative process that produced our features, often uh, maybe, maybe the, uh, it's easier to make our generative assumptions, uh, vice versa, sometimes it's easier to make our discriminative uh, assumptions. Uh, so uh, I write different assumptions, which is, is easier for in which the case the assumptions are more realistic is often uh, a data set specific question.